In sprinting, we see athletes of a wide range of heights competing at the elite level. So how much does height really factor into sprinting ability? And what are the advantages and disadvantages associated with being an athlete at the taller or shorter end of the height spectrum? When people think of the sprinting advantages that come with being taller, they usually think of taller athletes having a larger stride. But this assumes that greater height is always accompanied by greater leg length since leg length will play the biggest part in maximum stride length potential. A common trait among elite sprinters is to have long legs relative to their overall height, but the leg length to body height ratio will vary from athlete to athlete, so it can be the case that an athlete will be 2 inches taller than another athlete, given the illusion that he will have a greater stride length potential, but both athletes may actually have the exact same leg length. So is the 6'3 athlete less efficient in structure than the 6'1 athlete, because he has a longer torso that doesn't serve any particular advantage to him while sprinting. The actual height of the upper body doesn't matter as much as body weight. If the athlete with a torso that's 2 inches taller is carrying an extra 5 kgs of weight, then it may be a hindrance to him. But if both athletes have the same leg length and a similar body weight without weight training, then there is no science to say that the extra torso length is a hindrance. In distance running, a long leg length and light body weight is a very favorable combination to have. In swimming, the ideal body type is a long torso and short legs. It's like the long hull of a canoe for speed over the water. And the opposite is advantageous in running. You want long legs and a short torso. Here you see Michael Phelps standing next to Hisham El Garouge, the world record holder in the mile. These men are seven inches different in height. But because of the body types advantaged in their sports, these men have the same length legs. If El Garouge had the same torso length as Phelps, it would mean he would have more weight to carry around the track, which would hinder his running endurance. This is why I say the formula of leg length to body weight ratio can be applied to sprinters as well, but of course there are many other factors we need to look at first. Until Usain Bolt came along, stride length wasn't seen as the cheat code to winning Olympic titles and making it look effortless. So why weren't sprint coaches always trying to entice tall athletes to focus on track? First we must look at what goes into speed. The two basic aspects are stride length and stride frequency. Stride length is the distance covered between each occasion that an athlete's foot hits the ground, while stride frequency is the amount of times an athlete's foot hits the ground, which can be calculated as a rate of footsteps per second. In the 100 meter semi-finals of the Tokyo Olympics, Su Bing Chan ran a time of 9.83 in which he took 48 strides. Dividing his race time by the number of strides leaves us with a result of 4.88 Hz, which represents his stride frequency. Usain Bolt on the other hand achieved a frequency of 4.28 Hz as he took 41 strides to cover 100 meters in his 9.58 world record. However, this is still exceptional considering his leg length. And many athletes have pointed out that having a frequency that's competitive with sprinters who are far shorter than him is what gives him such an advantage. So Bolt is the greatest ever because he covered ground like that tractor wheel, but his turnover was more like, like a mini cooper. Think of every time that, that, big, um, that big tractor wheel turns, think of how much ground that's going to cover and now you get it really spinning that thing is really going to be covering ground somebody 65 is not supposed to be able to turn his legs over like somebody 59 you know 65 his stride length is this big and mine's this big so he covers a lot more ground than i cover so that's where his advantage comes in so if having long legs works as such an advantage for bolt why is it that other sprinters of similar height and leg length aren't able to achieve the same results? The next closest athlete to Bolt in terms of stride length is his countryman Kamar Bailey Cole, who managed to run his personal best of 9.92 in just 41 strides with a frequency of 4.13. Bailey Cole is 6'4 and was touted as possibly being the second coming of Bolt in his early career as he even spent time at Racers Track Club where Bolt trained throughout his career, but he was never able to push on and break into the 9.8 range. 6'2 Joseph Fambele has a frequency close to Bailey Cole with 4.18 as he took 41.8 strides to run 10 seconds flat in his personal best race in last year's NCAA final. But with the potential to run faster, Fambele's frequency will increase if he manages to run sub 10 seconds while maintaining the same stride length. When we look at other tall sprinters, we have 6'3 Lemaitre who typically took 42 strides to cover 100 meters. 
even doing so in 41.2 strides during a preliminary run. This shows that by losing form towards the end of a race and decelerating before the line, you can actually take less strides, but it will mean that you're not covering the ground as fast. This is why athletes who overstride in the pursuit of covering more ground with each stride can be hurting their times as it can lead to spending too much time in the air which takes on resemblance to the runway actions of a triple jump. An athlete who actually worked to shorten their stride to reinvent their race pattern was Justin Gatlin. In the 2004 Olympic final, Gatlin won gold in the time of 9.85 while taking 42 strides for a frequency of 4.26. Later on in Gatlin's career, at the 2016 Olympic Trials, he took 44 strides to run 9.80 for a stride frequency of 4.49. While Gatlin was above average height for a sprinter, with long legs leading to a long stride length, he said that in order to compete with Bolt, he needed to go from being a strong finisher to being someone who leads the race from the gun with a bullet start. Increasing his stride frequency did have a role to play in helping his change in race strategy, since getting your foot back onto the ground quicker is beneficial when you're trying to accelerate from the set position. This is why fast starters like Sue and Coleman have rapid initial steps, but I'll speak more on these later in the video. I'm usually known to be a guy who can come on late, you know what I mean, and overstride. I was called a long strider for a long time. So like everyone would see my legs coming before they see my body. You know what I mean? Like, oh, here come, he's inching up, he's inching up. Now you flip that, and now you're going against somebody who's 6'5", I'm 6'1", and he has that same capabilities. So literally I had to, I had to compartmentalize a whole section of my training that would cater to competing and combating against someone like you saying. I'm in front. Do you know Bolt. you're in front? I know I'm in front right then. As Bolt does, he starts hitting them long strides and long steps. And it's the only person has I have ever competed against where I see their legs coming before they come. <laughs> like I a always, praying mantis. <laughs> I always heard, like a Clydesdale, I always heard that I, that's what I look like when I ran, run against people, like when I'm running people down, like you see my legs coming before you see my whole body. I never felt that <laughs> until that moment. Going back to the comparison of tall sprinters, some athletes who stood at 6'4 but didn't have the same 42 strides pattern that's characteristic for tall sprinters were Ryan Bailey and Reese Prescott. Bailey instead covered the 100m in 43.5 strides, with Prescott usually covering 100m in 43.5 to 44 strides as well, something that athletes several inches shorter are able to achieve. So why weren't Bailey or Prescott able to hit the 42 strides mark or below? In Ryan Bailey's case, being probably the heaviest sub-10 sprinter ever at close to 100 kgs may have been hindering how much he could propel himself forward with each foot strike. Bailey's legs weren't overly long relative to his torso, but Reese Prescott is an athlete whose leg proportions resembled Usain Bolt. So what was stopping Prescott from completing his races in less strides? Prescott is quite an inconsistent sprinter who may have achieved his best performances based more on his natural talent than on developing his technique. And while his leg cycle does look long and winding, he doesn't seem to generate the same amount of force to propel himself forward as athletes who emphasized frontside mechanics. Francis Obikwelu was a tall sprinter who ran with impressive frontside mechanics, which demonstrated a lot of power as he could cover 100 meters in 42 strides. This supports the idea that it's not just leg length which determines the amount of strides you take, but also how your foot strikes the ground, and having your foot land directly under your center of mass increases your ability to travel straight forward down the track. If we take the requirement to be classed as an exceptionally tall sprinter to be 6 foot 3, then we could consider Fred Hurley to be the second fastest ever among exceptionally tall sprinters with his PB of 9.76. This is assuming that Asafa Powell with his PB of 9.72 is a fraction under 6 foot 3. No, the taller sprinters are taking over, so you know, the taller you are, I think it's better now. <laughs> no, when Fred Curley ran 9.79 in the heats of the World Championship, there were some rumblings that if anyone was going to get close to Usain Bolt's world record, then he may be the man to do it. Curley's 100 meter PB is the same as his countrymen Coleman and Brunel, but Carly's foundation in the 400 meters and switch to focus in the 100 is reminiscent of Bolt, as well as the fact that Carly is close in height to Bolt. The reason why Usain Bolt was able to break the 
world record was not just because of his speed, all right? It was because of his actual, the not dynamics of his body, how tall he was, how much force he could put into the ground. Now, the next person that would be able to break that world record, I would say you have to be able to have those same type of measurements. Who's running right now that has those same type of measurements that you saying both has? Fred Curley, he's pretty tall, he's pretty strong, okay? When we ask why there aren't more tall sprinters competing today, if they have the potential for greater stride length and force production, we need to remember how small they are with regards to the total population. Fred Curley has even said that if he could change something about himself, he would prefer to be taller so he could go to the league. If you can change one thing about yourself, what would it be? I don't know why I wouldn't be a little taller. Like 6'6", six, six. maybe I could have been a lead. Six, seven, six, eight. This makes you think about how many tall athletes potentially had elite talent for track, but got picked up by other sports. A high school football player named Nicholas Harper ran a 100 meter time of 10.28 at just 16 years old, and his personal best stands at 10.22 with a 0.9 headwind. What makes these times more impressive is the fact he could run them while standing at six foot six and weighing 230 pounds, surely a sign that he could be a sub 10 sprinter with a diet and training routine focused solely towards track. So can a below average height sprinter ever break the world record again, with the last to do it being Murray Screen in 1999, or will it take another exceptionally tall sprinter to break it? Johan Blake and Tyson Gay both stand as the second fastest men in history with their PBs of 9.69, and they represent the current peak achieved by average height sprinters. And if you were to put yourself now as a coach, and you're coaching somebody to beat Hussein, Bolt. Right. Would you kind of go to the manual and have a look, or do you throw the manual away and start again? I would first probably get him some like some some stilts, like some taller stilts. You know what I'm saying? Give him a few more inches. But <laughs> nah, I mean, at the end of the day, he's what some people call a freak because he's six five, if I'm not mistaken, and he has the frequency of someone who's five nine. You know what I mean? And when you put them two together, that's a turnover and straddling, so it's very tough to beat, you know. Trayvon Brumell and Christian Coleman both have PRs of 9.76 and they represent the peak achieved by shorter sprinters, but they still have the potential to improve on those times. I think that because the 100 meters is such a short event, it's going to be very hard for an athlete who has an average stride pattern of 45 strides to close the gap between 9.69 and 9.58. However, there is an athlete on the rise who stands at six foot tall and completes his races in 42 to 43 strides, and that athlete is Letzile Tobogo. Tobogo hasn't run any race yet to his full potential since his PR of 9.91 was set while showboating early. This means it's hard to get a proper race model to accurately examine Tobogo's stride, but the fact that he can cover 100 meters in a relatively low amount of strides thanks to his long legs while also having a light body weight from being very lean and no taller than 6 foot means he already looks like he could have 9-6 potential someday. The 100 meters is probably the sprint event where the widest range of ages and body types are capable of excelling at the event. Trinan Holiday with a PB of 10 flat is the shortest ever elite sprinter at 5 foot 5 while Bolt is the tallest at 6 foot 5 but there have been a catalogue of short sprinters to run under 10 seconds which include Mike Rogers, Steve Mullins, Michael Freighter, Leron Clark, Su Bing Chan, Divine Oladuru, Nesta Carter, Andre Kaysen and Ferdinand Omanyala. Running 9.7 isn't unfamiliar territory for short sprinters, but as things stand, going faster than that will be difficult because they won't be able to match the stride length of taller sprinters since longer legs have the potential to produce more force because they begin their descent downwards to the ground from a higher starting point. Increasing their stride frequency may be possible, but the best short sprinters have already reached frequencies of 4.88 in Su Bing Chan's case and 4.83 in the case of Omen Yala with 4.81 for Coleman and Brumel. In the 200 meters, we have had four short sprinters run 19.7 or below, with Divine Adaduro, Reynar Mena, Clarence Munyai and Walter Dix, but we have yet to see one dominate the event. This is probably what created the narrative that taller sprinters are more suited to the longer sprint events, which as I mentioned in my last video, was the reason Bolt's coach was reluctant to let him try the 100 until Bolt upheld his end of a bet by breaking the Jamaican national record in the 200. But why if being taller doesn't make an athlete any more suitable for running the 200 meters than the 100 meters? Out of the four fastest 200 meter runners in history, three of them are between 5 foot 10 and 6 foot tall, 
with Johan Blake's performance of 19.26 actually being faster than Bose world record of 1919 when reaction times are excluded. The gap of 0.07 seconds between the fastest and second fastest man ever seems small when compared to the 100m gap of 0.11 seconds, which is why I think the 200 world record will be broken before the 100 world record, and why I think Noah Lyles has the best shot of doing it. As I said earlier in the video, the 100 is such a short race that you don't have time to make up ground on an athlete with equal turnover who's taking 10% less strides than you are. But when it comes to the 200 meters, where deceleration is a bigger factor, athletes who can hold their speed for longer will see success with stride size being less important. Do you think the next person to challenge the 100 meter world record will be a tall athlete, or will we see barriers being broken by shorter sprinters in the near future? Please leave your thoughts in the comments and thanks for watching.